Hey, I'm Pat Healy, and this episode of the Berkeley Online podcast, Music is My Life, is all about my friend. He's a DJ, and uh, he DJed my wedding a bunch of years ago. And um, currently, he DJs at a few other places. Like Fenway Park, the Boston Garden, and Gillette Stadium. That's right. Our guest this month that you need to take note of is TJ Connolly, the DJ for the 2018 World Series champs, the Boston Red Sox, the 2019 Super Bowl champs, the New England Patriots, and he has lately been filling in as a DJ for the Boston Bruins and the Boston Celtics. TJ and I became friends about 20 years ago when he was a DJ at a comedy club in Boston called Improv Asylum, where the woman that I am proud to now call my wife was a performer at the time. And TJ began DJing for the Red Sox in 2005, incidentally in the same year he DJed our wedding. And I only keep mentioning this because in our discussion he mentions it as a significant milestone in his own DJing career, which I am honored by. Another significant moment is when he became a DJ at WFNX, a local radio station that went off the air in 2012, just as TJ had gotten a slot. So even if you don't live in Boston or know what WFNX was or how special it was, the story will be familiar to you as the modern radio landscape continues to get more and more automated and less and less personal. If you're not a fan of Boston sports or even sports in general, rest assured, the conversation is mostly about music and the strategy required to choose which songs at any given moment will tap into the mood of an enormous crowd. TJ's love of music began long before he and I met, which admittedly was also long ago. For TJ Connolly, it began with the Beach Boys. We'll let him tell you. My early musical memories are my dad being a huge Beach Boys fan. Mm -hmm. um, and. You know, he had like a drum kit and a reel-to-reel -reel and uh, whatever in the basement. And he would play along with different Beach Boys tracks or whatever surf music he was listening to. I mean, I remember as a child singing along with Barbara Ann yeah. in the way that children will sing along with Barbara Ann, like the happiest <laughs> kids in the world, like ba 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 whatever, you're yeah. very happy. So that, and then just like tooling around, riding in the backseat of the car while my mother's driving around, that was like... My dad was also a gadget person, and mm. so he bought a CD player right of, right when that happened. Mm. And we had a CD player that was, you know, the size of a suitcase. Right. And, like, the drawer was heavy. Yeah. You know, it wasn't quite, like, the top-loading VCR, but it was yep. right there. And was very excited about, like, audio fidelity and whatever else, and so that sort of rubbed off. And Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And I never knew that. Yeah, I mean... When I say excited about audio fidelity, I mean, we had the finest things that Radio Shack sold. Yep. But... Those were actually pretty good yeah. at the time. <laughs> yeah. um, and so being sort of a gadget head, that also clearly has carried on. Yeah, so I eventually had a cassette deck and a CD player, and that meant that I could make mixtapes that sounded like actual tapes, yeah. and not just like from the radio. And making those mixtapes and whatever is sort of what got me into curating and arranging and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think the first time I really did it anywhere anyone would notice was uh, the Charlie's Kitchen jukebox. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I, I had no idea that was like your first foray into that. Yeah, well, kind of accidentally, like I was living at Charlie's Kitchen pretty yeah. much like you do. And um, I was there one day when they were switching the CDs. And I mean, that jukebox was like amazing. Yeah. And they were inspired to make a great jukebox by the jukebox at um, Foley's, I want to oh, say. Yeah. The one, the, jukebox, the, the yeah. Downtown Crossing one. Yeah. Um, not Downtown Crossing, yeah, whatever. You yeah, know the, what I mean. the one with the checkered floor. Yes, yeah. that one. Late <laughs> the night one Foley's. That Bono stood on a box to say thank you to Steve Morse at <laughs> Really? Yeah. They were that makes in town sense. and it was during Steve Morse's Was there a crowd or was he just trying to get eye level? He was just trying to he's a short guy. I know. Yeah. And so, Steve Morse is tall. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I was wondering. Maybe he was trying to get eye level. Didn't have to be Morse. anybody else yeah. in the room, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh no, it was Steve Morse's retirement party and you two happened oh, to be in cool. town and he came by and stood on a box and gave a speech. That's pretty wild. Yeah. Um and yeah, I just happened to be there on the day they were loading the jukebox. Yeah. And my big revolution, or revelation, one of the two, both, was, you know, why do we have to have the entirety of this album that has two songs we like on it right. taking up a whole slot when yeah. we could burn CDs 
yeah. and have mixes in there. So yeah, I just sort of became part of the group of people who worked on the jukebox. Uh, I still have a, like a bunch of old mixes that were in the jukebox and or like inserts. Eventually, ended up like talking to the jukebox company and yeah. getting involved in it for real. But oh, that was awesome. my like that and hosting karaoke. Weirdly enough, yeah, were the sort of bar based. Here are things that people listen to. Yeah, you know, while they're out, right, and figuring it out from there. I think feel like I remember you saying at one point that it was always your dream to be the DJ at Fenway. And kind was that, of was that like. I would say the real dream was to be the DJ at WFNX. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Because um, forever, I mean, I was a baseball fan when I was a kid because I grew up here and that's, it's yeah. in the water. I don't even remember at what point, you know, in like high school or whatever, that WFNX came onto my mm -hmm. radar, but that was a thing I, I was I, into. I was in sixth grade when I first heard it. Yeah. 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 And it was weird when it first started because they'd play stuff like, um, they'd play like Tom Petty every now and then. Oh, yeah. And they'd play like, Rock and Roll Girls by John Fogarty, and then they got into like full on. We yeah, are I think as the program directors changed, yeah, you know, there was also the period where they were like disavowing any band that sold a record. Yeah, you know, yeah. And they were like, we're not playing this anymore. Yeah, and you're like, they're called Nirvana. It's okay. <laughs> 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 um, you know, my favorite example of that was FNX playing the hell out of Mbop. Really? Oh yeah. I didn't know that. That's awesome. They played it like crazy right up until Hans became clear that Hanson was going to be Hanson. Yeah, yeah. And then they were like, "This never happened." <laughs> <laughs> I remember, one of my fondest memories of that song is going to Fenway actually, and, really? and my hair was a little bit longer, and like dudes in the bleachers were like, "It's Hanson! It's Hanson!" <laughs> what? That's, That's bizarre. Yeah, it was kind of funny. Yeah. Maybe they'd never seen a dude with longer hair. I know. Before. What a random know. heckle, yeah. though. Like. <laughs> It was funny, though. I mean, was it 1998 exactly? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, there you yeah. go. Okay. So. Ah, the bleachers. Anyway. Um, but yeah, so was super excited about radio and then uh, and listened all the way through. Mostly, I stopped listening to FNX when they became like a new metal cesspool. Right. Um, right. Actually, the first CD I put in the Charlie's Kitchen jukebox, I knew famously, was, that yeah. got me into the trouble a little bit. <laughs> yeah, what, what was the trouble that it got in? I mean, well, it wasn't that it got me in trouble. It's just that a series of FNX DJs over time discovered yeah. that I was the one who made it and, or that it and, existed. And the and actual title was when, when FNX, FNX was cool, yeah. which was also the title after that of my first DJ night at River Gods when yeah. they first opened. But um, anyway, yeah, and like Julie Craig did like a whole bit about it on the air. Um, was she really pissed? Or is she, did I, she take it in stride? So or? I haven't actually, I can't remember if I ever talked to her about it. I don't yeah. think that I have because I feel like I would remember. Yeah. Um, and she probably would not. Yeah. But I, uh, I like to think that the people who made a stink about it who had been there the whole time were in some way subtly rebelling. Right. Against like, and now that I've told you that, that we're still cool. Yeah. Here's some puddle of mud yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh god what have i done <laughs> um anyway so yeah so that uh was the thing and then djing and bars and whatever but the baseball came into it mostly because i was doing improv asylum mm -hmm. and making jokes with music about what just happened or was about to happen or right. keeping crowd energy up and then went to a baseball game one day and my predecessor i assume played something that was funny, probably mm -hmm. about a pitcher taking too long or something like that. Yeah. And I just perked up. I was like, huh? Uh-huh. Oh, somebody's doing this. Yeah. You know, kind of the same way nobody ever thinks that there's a DJ pro like the number of times that I've had a conversation with someone who I don't know who's introduced and they're like, what do you mean you're the DJ? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I play all the music you hear and they're like, and they just make like a blank face. And uh, I'm like, and after a while, it eventually leads to Neil Diamond. Yeah. And I'm like, you're familiar <laughs> with Sweet Caroline. And yeah. they're like, sure, yeah, they play it all the time. I was like, somebody pushes that button, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, wow. And then, of course, it just devolves into a Sweet Caroline conversation, right. which whatever, which is about as deep as that conversation should go. Yeah. If it's just occurred to them that there's music at sports games. But, right. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but I, I do definitely want to know, like, so you started there what what year at Fenway? Fenway, I started, I got the backup job in 05. Okay. After wow. uh, writing a letter a, a year saying, please yeah. let me try it for a day. Right, so how, um, long, how long were you writing a letter a year? I think it would be 2002 and 2003, and maybe 2004. I feel like I wrote three letters and I can't remember whether I sent the last one mm -hmm. because then they called. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, for a couple of years there, That's you know, wild. um, my whole fandom was just reawakened by, uh, this place where a girl I was seeing was living. Like these dudes just got up early every Sunday mm-hmm. and hung out and watched baseball on Sunday mornings. And I was like, well, this is nice. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, I was probably hung over. Yeah. But I was like, this is a really easy intro to the day. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, then it just sort of got all that rolling again. Cool. So it all kind of came together yeah. real nicely that way. And then in 2008, my predecessor retired and they said, hey, you want to be everyday guy? Yeah. I said, yes, please. Wow. So it's coming up 11 years. Yeah. 11 full seasons, That's I guess. amazing. Yeah. And I never knew. I tend to count it from 05 myself only for the fact that like, you know, I was, uh, <laughs> this is uh, the first time this comparison has occurred to me. I, okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be good. Yeah. Uh, Tobias Fumke dressed up as a blue man every night. Yeah. That was me, 2005, 2006, 2007. Right. Like, they might need me. Right. You know? Oh, that's awesome. Um, and so I guess there wasn't a game on June 18th or a home game. Which, yes. Yes. Yeah, no, right. The wedding, luckily. Well, that was, I mean, I, w- I would make plans. Right. Okay. Um, but you, there's like an availability email for every homestand, right. and I would always be like, every game, every game, yeah. every game, every game. Cool. Um, what do you remember yeah. the first time? And one time I did get the like, it's four o'clock, can you come in? Yeah. Call. Holy crap. Which was, you know, that just seated yeah. further every day, bluing myself, right. <laughs> <laughs> as it were. Uh, <laughs> That is a um, great comparison. <laughs> I cannot believe it has not yeah, occurred to me yeah. before now, but there was I was, you know, ready to go. Ready to um, go. In blue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you remember the first song you played there? Well, the first one that I chose, I think. Yeah. Um, was probably Town Called Malice by The Jam. Yeah. Or Hateful by The Clash. Yeah. So pretty much right from the get-go year, or right from the bat, as it were, to extend the pun, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> was to bring music to the stadiums that normally wasn't played there. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't trying to, you know, shatter any dominant paradigm or anything. It was yeah. more that I was just sort of, uh, I mean, that seemed like a really cool thing to play yeah. in front of a big group of people. Yeah. And uh, I weirdly didn't bring over a lot of the stuff that I had been using at Improv Asylum immediately. Like, uh-huh. I definitely played Town Call Malice at Improv Asylum a bunch. Uh-huh. Um, I remember, actually, there was, like, a round table with all of the people in production that Dr. Charles was running. And, like, the icebreaker question was, like, what song would you play at the park? Mm-hmm. And I, th- I was still a backup person, and it came around. I was sitting next to the actual DJ. Yeah. And those were my answers. Yeah. I remember I was like, Tongue Called Mouse by the Jam or yeah. Hateful by the Clash. And yeah. like all of the people in the room just look at me like, I... <laughs> Sorry, dude, you almost had the job. Don't but... know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Any of that. Um, but I mean, I've played them many times since. Yeah. They're great. It's It has to have that sort of, you know, even if it is not immediately familiar, it has to be like pleasantly accessible. I right, think. right. Yeah, I think those are probably the first ones. And then the other big thing was taking all of the like hit songs, you know, like Ball and Play, whatever. Yeah. And just dropping like a ton of early rap and electro and like break beats and stuff into that and oh, making wow. that. I didn't know you did that. Like, yeah. I like, mean, like stuff that's, you know, I mean, Din Dada by George Kranz, yeah. right? Like the most crazy yeah. like dance hall, whatever. So you do some production stuff too then. I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, with a wave editor. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's cool. it's funny to me always that people are like production, and I'm yeah. like, oh, you mean so like I've been doing like with Hamadeus Pro on an ancient Macintosh right. for many years? Yes, I guess that is what that but is. So, are you like doing mashups in essence, or just uh, just shortening the? Uh, I tried. I so I actually got really into mashups when yeah. it first became a thing. Yeah. And I made a couple. Yeah. And they were not great. Yeah. Um, because I didn't really. So I don't I don't play instruments. Right. Which now I would tell you doesn't necessarily mean I don't know how to produce anything either. Right. But like multi-track editing on like a four track or something was nothing I ever did. Yeah. And so like even getting to the point where the computer was strong enough to edit, you know, I would be editing a wave file and be like save and you'd be like, "Well, I'll just go and take a shower." Yeah. You know, like it was <laughs> a while to get the stuff done. I mean, I had a great mashup going with it was um REM's radio song. Yeah. And Mexican Radio by Wall of Voodoo. Okay. And the two aliens from Sa- not from Sa- from Sesame Street. 
you know, hip, dip, 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 oh, dip, yeah, dip, dip, yeah. dip, dip, radio, which yeah. was the same as the Wall of Voodoo radio. Right. And then the Karis one in the middle okay. there. And yeah, a lot of, lot of potential, not yeah. a lot of execution. Yeah. yeah. Just, just a lot of really bad final version four type stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now and then I will take, you know, if there's like just a good measure, mm. I'll loop it. Yeah. Now I would probably go ahead and play it, but like a great example of one that's more cr- like the LCD sound system, Dance Yourself Clean, which yeah. is often the moment when a lot of people who will perk up and go, huh? Yeah. Wasn't expecting to hear that. Yeah. That's a loop. So let's backtrack a little bit now. What was the first paid gig that. Uh, well, so there was Improv Asylum that I showed up for. Yeah. And <laughs> Of course, my first actual show up and play music, bring speakers, et cetera, et cetera, your wedding. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Which was, cr- it was just crazy. I mean, you, when you all asked me like, hey, do you DJ our wedding? I was like, sure, <laughs> that'd be cool. With n- almost no idea of how to do that. Really? I mean, but I mean, had you, been to you weddings. You knew how to work a room though. I mean, God, if we if you had told us that from the get-go. We You'd have been like, we need to get somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, you, your your faith in this was was yeah. uh, very kind. And and actually, there's, you know, a couple stories from that that are, I still tell from time to time that went really well. But I mean, I was terrified the yeah. entire time. Because you just no have idea. that, like, I mean, first off, there's just the business of keeping the dance floor full, which right. went fine. Yeah. I mean, it went really well, yeah. which helps. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, that wasn't the last wedding yeah. I did either. And you prevented uh, my cousin's wife from spilling wine all over the mixing console. I do use <laughs> her as an example all the time. Uh, yeah, the, with a waving Chardonnay yep. and like You're a just like, bucket. Like, do yeah. Macarena? Yeah, there was Macarena. Uh, weirdly, the, the her she gets transposed into a story that I actually every time I do a wedding now. Yeah, I talk to the couple. There's this one as you go through the, like the phone call. Yeah. Um, it's amazing how this is like one of those things where it keeps happening to the point where every time it happens now, I'm like, I'm being punked somehow. Yeah. yeah. There's always an aunt mm-hmm. who really wants to hear we are family. Yep. And she now has the waving Chardonnay. Okay. Yeah, but gotcha. gotcha. So you should play we are family and the whole family can come out and dance to we are family. And yeah. I tell this story to the couples yeah. and I'm like, you may not think this is going to happen. You don't think this is your family. It doesn't matter. Yep. It will happen. <laughs> At that time, would you like me to say yes or no, or I'll look for it in pocket veto or what? Yes. Or you guys have a list. Yep. I'm happy to play it. It's your wedding. I will yep. play anything you want, you know, <laughs> but like it always clears the dance floor. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear nope. we are family anymore. Nope. And it's always that aunt then running around like grabbing cousins <laughs> and like making them <laughs> dance together. And cousins are like, why are we dancing with each other? Yep. This is not why we're yep. here. So, okay, so then Improv Asylum was the first job then as job, a DJ. Job, job. Funny for money. And uh, was that the slogan? Funny for money? I mean, that's the dream, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> that's right. Uh, but do you, you and so I mean, you, I went into that actually trying to get on the stage. Yeah. And then as it turned out, they needed a like, guy who knew theater lighting and a DJ. Yeah. And I am all of those people. And so it really worked out incredibly well. Right. Um, in terms of suddenly leading to a career that I didn't know was coming. Yeah. And yeah. and then at this point, you know, you're you're getting Fenway and and uh, you get into the rhythm of that. Are you still I mean, obviously you must still have the inkling to get on F and X or something because you eventually go to ZBC. Yes. And you, and you did F and X for a while too, right? I have before the final the happiest, last days. saddest dream come true story with F and X. Yeah. Um, I eventually started to meet the people just from Boston being a small place. I don't remember how that actually worked. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You know, they thought it was cool that there was this baseball DJ playing the jam, the Clash and whatever. And I was like, oh my God, you're on FNX, that's amazing. (laughs) You know, so after considerable like, hey, uh, what about me, FNX? Like really living the the dream situation. Finally, I got hired. Yeah. Um, And I trained, which you could go to Lynn at like six in the morning on a Sunday yeah. and you know they give you some room to screw it up there and like you have to use the the you know the station is run by software that you have to learn how to use and it's not like you're just throwing in CDs or whatever else right um, and yeah so I finished all my training did air checks whatever and they said great and I got scheduled for my first shift which was going to be on I think also Sunday and the station got sold Tuesday the next of Tuesday? that week the next Tuesday literally five previous? days before I was supposed to go oh, on the before. air for the first time oh no uh, and I mean I had been on the air yeah. I got to do it right. three or four times as right. like training right. but and I mean I was just overjoyed anyway yeah but yeah so that was 
heartbreaking. I'll bet. And it was also during like just another whole tough situation that yeah. was going on in my life. It was just like a lot of loss and people dying. I mean, it was just like yeah. a very dark time. Yeah. Uh, personally, and I was like, come on. Um, but and, then, and, so as, they, and they just went off, right? They didn't do any like final days of FNX, or did they? Well, I they did. Remember. No, this is the, this is the amazing. So there's a sad part of the story. Yeah. And the amazing part of the story is this. So uh, the station got sold, and then all of the DJs, I get, I guess the DJs basically got laid off okay. that week. And I, I think, texted, and I was like, uh, and didn't get a reply. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. was like, well, that probably means I'm not working Saturday. Yeah. Or Sunday or whatever it was. And the, everybody who was on the air at that time did farewell shows. Um, <laughs> you can't really do a hello, hello, goodbye, you could have called it. Right. <laughs> well, but, so that's the funny part. So they all left. They eventually went to the Globe and started Radio BDC. Yeah. And that continued on into Indy 617 now, which is great. And FNX was running with, like, the skeleton of skeleton crews. Because the p- software will run the station. I mean, it was oh, already doing okay. the overnights. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's without getting into a long discussion yeah. of it. Like you basically program a thing, and then that thing will choose songs based mm-hmm. on the, like an algorithm, like a formula you've made. Being like, play two of the old ones, one of the new ones, like oh, that wow. kind of stuff. That's, That's how wild. commercial radio works, okay. as I understand it, across the board at this right, point. Right. Mostly, the funny part is that that first piece of software runs like in DOS. Mm-hmm. Like if you look <laughs> at it, you're like, wow. Yeah. Wow. This is like configuring BIOS. Like okay. this is like, but nobody's ever updated it because radio. Right. So in a like dream serve dream situation, there was this thing just playing on autopilot for two months till they figured out what to do with the station. Right. Before um, it became the bull. Before right? the bull. Yeah. <laughs> That's tough. Yeah. That's real, real. Yeah, that's almost like insult to injury to all the yeah. people who formerly served there. It's really, yeah. Well, I mean, I'll, I think I particularly said served for, like it's a military I mean, tour of duty. Yeah. yeah. Well, they would probably not yeah. fight you too hard on that. <laughs> uh, it had its ups and downs, definitely. But um, long story short, for the couple people that were left, like management running it, and then um, there were just a couple shows that were still happening live. But uh, I got to do the very last night of oh, WFNX. Wow. That's wild. So they scheduled like a big farewell yeah. for this Friday before they were going to kill the signal and switch it over. And I did that Thursday night and I came in and deleted all the programming and played from seven o'clock until 1230 in the morning. Oh, wow. And then deleted the overnight and programmed all that to yeah. run on autopilot to like 330 in the morning. Yeah. That was the very real like actual dream come true situation. Okay. And. You know, I still had to use their software, mm-hmm. and you couldn't. Th- there was no way to just like play a CD. Yeah. So I was that whole night running around ripping CDs because at some point the whole FNX record library got deleted. Wow. Like they lost it in a hard drive crash or something, oh, or like ninety wow. seven. Wow. So all of these things that I grew up with, they weren't even in there. Wow. Like Think Tree and like yeah. uh, you know, whatever. just like the stuff that Ned's defined Atomic. FNX yeah. to you. Yeah. And I was like. I was motivated to do this because I, after leaving it on in my car, I was like, this has been an amazing radio station informative. Like, two months of group love yeah. is not the appropriate send off for right, this. Right, you know, right. like, this should be something bigger. And so I went on and I did it and programmed the whole thing. There's like actually, I mean, you're supposed to talk in commercial radio like every 20 minutes or yeah. something. There's like 50 minutes at one point where I'm it's just music. Yeah. Because I'm running in the other room trying to burn CDs as fast oh, as awesome. I can. And like other people are cleaning stuff up and they're kind of helping me out a little bit, trying yeah. to get it working. But, and I also am trying to figure out how to talk on the radio for the first time. Right. Which actually ended up being a great way to figure it out. Yeah. Um, Did you archive it somehow? Or like, I have it. I oh, didn't. Great. Yeah. But there was a guy who recorded the whole thing. Oh, that's awesome. And someone put me in contact. So I have a recording of the whole thing, which yeah. is... Uh, I mean, there are parts of it I look at, and I'm just like, oh. So but they they didn't even have like a turntable hooked up. No. Yeah. Wow. No. Well, because the like the ads and stuff get controlled by the same software, right, so it's right, all right. loaded in that okay. way. And you would, you could move everything around, but it was you know right. a closed system, so to speak. Interesting. And so I was like loading stuff onto its server, right, and then playing it and working that out. And right. like I remember the the first thing I played was Knowledge by Op Ivy. Okay. Because that seemed appropriate yeah. for someone doing radio for the very first time yeah. who had no idea what he was doing. I don't know that particular All song. I know is that I don't know. All I know is oh, that okay. I don't know nothing. That one, right. which I had to clean with yeah. my little wave editor before. Oh, nice, <laughs> and, nice. And then the last song was uh, uh, Sonic Youth, uh, The Diamond Sea. Oh, that's a good one. It was, yeah. uh, I, that, I, I don't know when it, the light went off, but yeah. that was, uh, I mean, it was sort of in the nascent, non-terrible days of social media, and so I was posting that I was doing it. I didn't have any time to send updates, really. Yeah. 
but there was like a giant Facebook thread oh, cool. of people who were into it, and then right. all these bars around town found right. out, and they just turned, put it on, oh, that's playing awesome. in the bar. Um, yeah, in the recording, there's all these different places I'm shouting out, like Trina's and whatever, yeah. where they just said like, F and X is over, and he's doing this thing. Let's just yeah. put it on. Yeah, and like I kept getting texts and messages. It's and whatever. Probably it was like crazy. the last time they used those radios. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean they were probably streaming too, yeah, for what it's true, worth. But right? like, I you know it was probably one of the last times, with the exception of something like the Best Show, where you're going to get the thing of everyone listening to you know everyone watching the same thing yeah. together. Yeah, or the, listening the to the radio culture. show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which was pretty great. Uh, there's a bit in the Facebook thread actually where. I'd start playing, you know, I said, I signed off and then I was like, I have like four or five more songs. And this is the last one I thanked everybody or whatever. And I played uh, The Diamond Sea. And at some point someone posts, oh my God, is he playing the whole thing? And then there's yeah. another comment from like 15 minutes yeah, later that's, that's like, great. since it's still on, I'm going yeah. with yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's the one Tom takes is crazy. Tom. Yeah, it's- Which is a great line to sum like that up. And like the whole up, static you know? situation with the diamond. Yeah, yeah. it was, it, it really all it came together. Oh, that's that, awesome. Yeah, I don't play that song. I get I goosebumps about that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Me too, nice. usually. <laughs> I, um, I, uh, yeah, I don't play that song very much unless yeah. there's a really good reason anymore. One of the craziest moments of that is driving home. So I programmed it all in, mm -hmm. no more talking. I really should have just deleted it all night, and put stuff in, but yeah. it was mostly the last three hours, the second set was, you know, like I am the resurrection, yeah. all eight minutes. Yeah. Like all these songs that were just awesome, yeah. but too long to fit into the five hour set that yeah. ended up being five and a half hours anyway. Yeah. Um, but I drove home uh, listening to the end of my own set oh, that's cool. on FNX yeah. while I was driving home at three in the morning, and that was like, that is a moment that I will remember for a long time. Yeah, that's it awesome. was someone great actually by LCD. At oh, the, nice. Yeah, and that wasn't my last last, but yeah. it was very close. That's awesome. Uh, but just having that huge bass booming out of yeah. my terrible Jeep Cherokee. <laughs> so Anyhow. okay, so that was like 2012. 12. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. When do you get the first Patriots call up, or when do you like first realize, you know what, I've I've conquered this this stadium. I want to do the <laughs> next one. Well, it didn't really work like that. Yeah. It was um. So 2013 is where I started with the Patriots, mm -hmm. and you know 2013 was obviously there was a lot of focus on the Red Sox because of all the stuff that happened and. You know, we sort of reacted to it by playing a lot more Boston music, like we were talking about right. playing Barrister Not. Like, in addition to playing, you know, the band Boston, yeah, and uh, <laughs> you know, other things that people might leap to when they think of uh, Boston bands. You know, we were also playing bands that had played in Alston that week, yeah. and like Jonathan Richmond, and right. like things that were more sort of across the full spectrum of music from Boston. You know, like. And uh, didn't know without really changing too much, just sort of taking it as a cue to lean into it, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And like throwing muses, like that's happening now. Yeah. Um, it was great. So as the music became sort of more of a thing during that year, I think, uh, I got a call from a woman who ran the show for the Patriots who used to work for the Red Sox. Mm -hmm. And uh, they wanted me to come in and see basically consult on like what their playlist was and talk about what could was good and bad and whatever. So I did that, I did a report for them about some things they could change and switch up. And they had me come back again and say, why don't you try just DJing a game? Yeah. And we'll see how it goes. Oh, that's cool. Uh, which was crazy. And it turns out the game I had me do is one that many fans remember because it was, uh, actually I don't know when, I think it was, it was like November, December, it was freezing. Mm -hmm. And by freezing I mean that it was zero Fahrenheit degrees or right. less on the field. And they're playing the Broncos, who at the time are of course the giant rival. Um, and at the end of the first half, the Broncos were up 24 nothing. Yeah. And at this point, Patriots make amazing comeback is kind of a thing. Yeah. At that point, less so. Right. It was amusing in that moment because it's 2013 and it's like the two minute warning of the uh, second quarter and the entire place is just dead. Like Patriots fans, when they are not winning, are in like a cold emotional place that they do not know how to deal with because they have had a lot of winning. Yeah. And, you know, coming from baseball, sometimes in baseball it's eight to one. And yeah. It's the fifth inning and we're all still going to be here for a while. Yeah. And the odds of coming back are always there, but not necessarily a thing. And so you kind of say, all right, well, at least let these people have a beer and dance. Right. And so I said, oh, let's let them dance. And all the people, the Patriots were like, they're not going to dance. Yeah, they're like, yeah. it's freezing out and yeah. they're sad. And I was like, okay, but it's 2013, so I played Get Lucky. Okay. 
and it's a night game too. It's like the eight o'clock oh, man. Sunday night football. Oh. Yeah, no, it was cold, bitter and cold. dark. <laughs> I have an entire three more layers of clothing that I own that I only own because I got the Patriots job. Yeah, from having to stay warm in that situation. Yeah, but so I played Get Lucky. Yeah, which like a for the Gillette fan base is kind of disco, mm-hmm. and B it was the summer jam with summer jams in right. 2013. It was huge. Yeah, and lo and behold. That two minute break, cheerleaders do their thing. We play Get Lucky, and the whole place gets on their feet and starts right. dancing. And plus, they're freezing. plus the like subtlety or not even subtlety of Get Lucky. Yeah, and we're win. up all night to Get win. Lucky. Right. It is ten o'clock. Right. Nobody wants to be here anymore. Right. But maybe it'll work out. Yeah. And then they come back and win the game. Yeah, and it's insane and incredible. And I would like to thank them for apparently making me look real good. Yeah, in yeah. That moment. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, they had me come on full time the next season. That's awesome. How hard is it to stay current? How much effort do you put into staying current? A bunch. It helps that there are requests. There are also places that, you know, I have a record pool. Uh, I just actually joined another record pool, which I think will be interesting. So you got to put some effort into it, basically depending on who you're playing for. Like, I'm pretty sure that the Gillette Stadium season ticket holder base would be basically okay if I never played a song that was released after, like, 1998 mm-hmm. um, but the players would be up in arms yeah and so you got to go with you know stuff like the Mobamba and whatever that's current and the funny thing about using those in the parade for the first time was uh, you know I have these cleaned clips that are so long and I felt like one of those club DJs who drives me crazy where they only play a snippet and not like they're doing turntablism or anything like they're right. just like the chorus the chorus the chorus <laughs> and I'm like the verse yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I just you're playing Bon Jovi. Just play the verse right, for right. like one verse, right. you know. So obviously, I do have a porch on which I get to yell at children to get off of the lawn. Right. But yeah, it's tough mixing the stuff together. The other thing is, I mean, the pop music, like mumble rap, does nothing for me. Right. Which is tough because like players are, are into it and kids are into it. I mean, kids. I mean, like people in their twenties and right. also kids. It doesn't energize a crowd. Right. And that is super tough. Yeah. And you can make a bunch of remixes and work it out. You know, I feel like the giant tsunami wave of like how all of pop music now sounds more alike than any other time that I remember pop music sounding alike, Mm -hmm. uh, which is all of it. Yeah. I mean, my library goes back to 1920. Yeah. Which is nice having a hundred year old ballpark where you can play that kind of stuff. And that stuff sound, you know, any genre sounds like itself to some degree. The thing where we now have, instead of having, you know, the good example is like, you know, you can always play Motown and people will start bopping their heads because those are great songs. Right. But now you have things that are just like today's banger that are completely disposable. Right. And you go to play, you know, if I play a song from last year, people are just kind of like, eh. Right. Because it was good for the three weeks that it was good and now it's over. Right. And they don't really have any lasting power. Yeah. And that is draining right just trying to figure out how to play some of that in and I used to do it at a slower rate and just sort of bring stuff that like did seem to have a bit of last to it or like what was just a huge summer jam if that summer jam was available yeah to some degree I think as also sports marketing is a thing that you can major in in college now and Mm -hmm. show up and like the, uh, the athletes show up having grown up with the WWE so everybody knows what walk up music is right right like they come to sort of say I don't think as many people in my position are doing what they can do to keep it interesting and unique. Mm-hmm. A lot of places are playing the same thing, and as people move around in the industry, they're like, why Why did you just play Bieber? Right. And I'm like, well, this isn't that great a song. Yeah. And I know it's hot right now, but maybe I'll play it once. Right. But right. not a bunch of times. Right. And keeping going, churning through stuff like that quickly is tough and it's also just not very fun because you don't really feel like you're creating like a unique Boston sports experience right right that is I mean all of these places that ended up working have been because it was different than the lat like what they were already doing right so it's weird to sort of have the other side of that yin yang <laughs> being oh play this from an hour ago and I'm right. like eh. and some of them are really good right. some of them totally work but some of them are just you know but yeah, I mean, you mentioned that. What like, everybody on Twitter is hot on this hot second. Right. Or whatever. You, you mentioned that about, like, what everybody else is playing, but, like, I don't think any other stadium is playing Fugazi. 
you know? <laughs> right. But neither are the people who are majoring in sports marketing aware right. of what Fugazi is. Right. And they don't put a value on it. Right. Because they don't see it that way. Right. Which is fine. I and mean, that's just generational. Yeah. It's, it's a blessing and a curse. Because on the blessing side, you know, Weezer does a cover of a Toto song. Right. Like, the most requested song I have gotten for the last two years has been Africa. Yeah. And that you can play Toto. Yeah. And people are into that. Yeah. And, you know, you can sort of... And likewise, the people who are the music supervisors for, like, you know, all the Adam McKay movies, like the Judd Apatow, whatever, all of those are all drawing from that. I mm-hmm. mean, the first time I went to one of those movies, I was sitting there, where it was while I was at Improv Asylum, and they were playing, like, stuff I played at the theater. Right. And I was like, hey, <laughs> that's mine. Wait, that's my thing. am I doing this wrong? <laughs> what should I be doing with my life? And so there's that, too. So you can kind of call it, like, the Deadpool movies are a great example of yeah. that. Like, hey, everybody. Who loves air supply? Yeah. All of you right now. Right. Weird. Yeah. So that's the great part of it. But the downside is Drake is awful. Right. And, right. you know, I do a, a guest lecture uh, at Emerson like once a year. And I said, Drake is awful to them. And they looked as if I had punched their sister or something. <laughs> you know, they were like, what do you mean? And I was like, it's just, it's, I know he's the most popular guy in the world. It's just not, there's not a lot of there there. Yeah. You know, it doesn't do it for me. So it's, that's the counterpoint. Right. You know? We've spoken about this in, in the past, but I want to get it on record. Is <laughs> what is uh, what is the difference in approach of those two? Like you, you recognize innately that it's a totally different group of people, and you yes. have to play different selections to get these people to do to get the reactions you're looking right. for. Right. Well, so it ties into a thing that uh, I think I kind of started to warm up and get big on in like 2012, 2013, anyway which is the joy of playing music that makes lots of people sing along. Yeah. And like, most people would say, oh, yeah, Sweet Caroline. And I'm like, yeah, that's like a ba ba ba. Yeah. That's not singing. That's, I mean, it's nice. Yeah. People want to argue with me about the song. I'm like, but they, they sing together. The world isn't a nightmare. Yeah. Let, let people sing together for 10 minutes and yeah. everybody will be friends. So with Gillette, I mean, first off, the biggest lesson for that and for hockey is that it is always at a 10. Yeah. Like baseball, if it's the third inning, and nothing much has really happened, <laughs> you're not going to drop like a banger because right. people are going to be like, what is this thing that is, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's Too jarring. Soon. It's like Sweet Caroline doesn't come right. to the second Well, inning. but it's like it, it informs the whole, like the mixtape making as a kid was what really informed the way to do a baseball game because there is a certain flow. Like once you get some energy from the field and they start scoring, you build on it and try and keep it and keep it up. Yep. But if nothing is going on and it's just a couple one, two, three innings, yeah. You know, you can come in in the middle, kind of, but if you hit them with, like, Panama, yeah. people are going to be like, what are you doing? It's 95 degrees. Like, yeah, right. I'm losing weight sitting here sweating. Like, you know. I don't want this. I can't. It's, I don't have this. Yeah. Like, you know. Um, Use the seat back. Whereas you could start you could start the day with Panama at 11 in the morning for a 1 o'clock game right. at the Patriots, and they're like, yeah, yeah, let's do this fight or whatever. Yeah, the, it's the, the the great yin and yang of party versus fight is right. like my whole job. Yeah, uh, no matter where I am, but um, <laughs> those are the two energies. Yeah, <laughs> that you're kind of balancing. It's not quite a yin and yang as much as like same coin. I, don't know. I mean, Maybe but so is that kind yeah, of you know, know. The, the force surrounds us and yeah. binds us. I don't know, whatever. Right. So that was a big change, and then just sort of getting a handle on the demographic of the season ticket holders and how. At least the time I was there, like there probably weren't a lot of season ticket holders who were my age. Right. They're all a little bit older. And then the other side of that is the players who are all much younger and not as much into Bruce Springsteen. Right. Interesting. Um, and you have to try and get them psyched up. Yeah. Like in baseball, it's built in. Right. Every guy gets his psycho music. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. But that doesn't exist really in football. And so you have to kind of build for that. And so part of it was building like a good warm up mix for pregame when the players are out there warming up. Mm hmm. And figuring out how that worked and then figuring out how to integrate some of that into the rest of the program in a way that is also friendly to, you know, the season ticket holders. And it it helps a lot, I think, too, as like, I mean, those people have kids Mm -hmm. and those kids increasingly grew up in a genreless world Mm -hmm. of hearing a song and then going to listen to the entire catalog and keeping it or dispensing with it and that taking two hours. Yeah. And so, you know could get away with playing f- like My House by Flo Rida, yeah. which the season ticket holder base would have no idea what this is, but they know it because it's playing in their cars because their kids are playing or whatever. Right, it's sort right. of figuring it out from there. It's like you sort of take the base idea of 
what did this person listen to in high school and college? Mm -hmm. And then extrapolating for everybody else in the building and other inputs. And at some point, I ended up having a conversation over there as I was trying to sort of work it out with getting people to sing along and getting people on their feet where I basically got, I had, I had not been playing as much pop music and I basically got the green light to get people to dance. Yeah. And that changed everything. Right, right. Because when you think of like Gillette Stadium, you think of like ACDC and like just... Everybody does and we don't even play that yeah. much of it. Like it's, it's everybody's <laughs> it's go-to is like, it's the NFL, all they play is Back in Black. And I'm like, <laughs> we totally don't ever play Back in Black. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Right, um, but no, I mean, as far as, yeah, that's yeah. the general perception. I mean, so. and even playing one, you yeah. know what I mean? They used to play Thunderstruck after every touchdown, so yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, it's not like it's not deserved, but... Right. Uh, it is a weird thing between what people think that we play and what we actually play. And then some of the bigger stuff we did, the crowd, like there was a moment where there was just a downpour and we played uh, Credence. Like, yeah. you know, uh, have you ever seen the rain? And all 80,000 people or whatever, screaming it at yeah. the top of their lungs. And yeah. that became a thing for the people to see it on TV and people hear it. And so like, the crowd sort of became aware, like usually, like a thing with the the um, Three Little Birds and Victorino, right? Like that started off kind of just tricking the crowd into singing along. Like yeah. everyone knows the words, but you play a bunch of it at the first at bat, yeah. and then just cut it off yeah. sooner and sooner, so the crowd hears themselves singing along to it. Weirdly enough, the song that has sort of become a big Patriots anthem, the "Your Love" by the Outfield, right, came from Fenway. I used to play it there all the time. I mean, it's by a band called The Outfield, right. for starters. And right. I used to play it actually as a comeback song, in like the middle of the fifth inning. If Patriots, uh, Patriots if the Red Sox are down by a couple runs, you know, but I don't want to lose your love tonight. But the entire crowd would be like, tonight, and yeah. you would hear them. They do it on the first one, yeah, and they would kind of hear each other and laugh. And then by the time you get around the second one, more people do it. And then one of our guys is up, and the energy is back up, oh, and it was perfect awesome. for that. And now it's funny, we don't play it at, we'd only play it at Gillette if the game is kind of in the bag. Yeah. You know, it's oh, like that's it, it's funny. like the Geno thing for the pit, the yeah. Celtics, where yeah. you know, if it's we're up by twenty five points and there's two minutes left, then it's, <laughs> it's Geno time and we all get to do that. Oh, so it's great. it's a weird sort of evolution of different things that work in different places. Yeah. And then the same thing has happened again for the Bruins. Yeah. Has been so and you're doing Bruins and Celtics now, right? Uh, I am the backup Celtics. Okay, backup yeah. Celtics. I've done Celtics. two or three games. Yeah. Um, so is that a continued learning curve with these other? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Celtics show itself is much easier because with, uh, I mean, for me, because both Red Sox and Bruins, I am not just the DJ, I'm also the audio engineer. Right. Like I'm running the mixer for the park right. or the, the uh, arena. You know, so if they have an in, like the Bruins, they have an in-game host who comes to do a contest and then yeah. they're playing a video from over here and another thing from over there and then it's just chaotic. There's a lot of like pressing, the pressing buttons is actually the harder part of it. Right. Um, and in Fenway, it's not as, I mean, the pacing is, the increase in pacing from baseball to football to hockey, I'm really glad it happened in that order. Yeah, is, is it, that is the order yes. that, of the pacing though? Well, like football's like, kind of nuts, but then it's also, you don't do anything while they're on offense. Yeah, right, Because right, you're right. trying to be quiet. Right. I actually okay. had an amazing realization, speaking of the various different demographics that work, right at the end of this season, Trying to get the crowd to quiet down is always a huge thing because they're like, Brady, and you're like, no, no, Mr. Brady needs to be able to hear his lieutenants. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's got to be a whole thing. <laughs> quiet. And so we have all these quiet pleas and whatever else. Yeah. And I have been thinking about, like, I mean, Hush by Deep Purple, that doesn't work. That no. sounds super loud. You know, just yeah. trying to come up. There are very few right. songs that are like, right. shush, you know, right. and like, shut up and dance isn't going to work. Like, yeah, people are going to no. scream. Right. Uh, and there are a couple moments when getting people to sing along with things at Gillette, I have managed to get them to sing at exactly the wrong moment. Which is always just a head on the desk situation. And yeah. you're like, oh, we're getting like, a phone what? call what? about that. <laughs> uh, well, you will appreciate that probably one of the the dumbest things I ever did there. It was a Christmas game, like two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. So we played a little Christmas music, not that much. But then the cheerleaders were all doing Christmas, and they were like, okay, this is going to be a lot of Christmas music. Like, also, there's a football game, and I was right. like, okay. But coming back from uh, from something, I played uh, "Santa Claus is Coming to Town" by Springsteen. Yeah. And round one, forgot that there's like a full minute of him just talking. Oh, yeah. As he's like, hey, man, cold down, down the beach. Like, <laughs> oh, my God. And Wind's so, whipping down the ball. But it's playing. <laughs> and like, I can't, you know, it's not like I have a record and I can kind of just bump right. the needle and move it along. Right. And it doesn't work. It's, you know, I'm sitting there and I was like, oh, this is awful. Like, there's no energy in this at all. Yeah. 
so already I was just like, and they're looking at me and I'm like, I know, I know, I know I screwed this up. I know. Yeah. It'll be over in a second. It'll be fine. <laughs> I already know that I screwed this up. <laughs> and I mean, everybody has a pretty good sense of humor about it too. Yeah. You know, they're like, oh, you're really screwed. Because like, I don't, luckily, you know, knocking on something far away from things that are recording, but you know, <laughs> don't they do okay with not doing that that much, hopefully. And right. then you're trying to be quiet for the offense and the chorus came in right when we're supposed to stop and right. so and, 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 and I turn it up we turn up the song and the whole crowd goes Claus get right when they're trying to call a play and I was just like and I remember like my boss sits on the right side of me and yeah. she just sort of turned and looked at me and I was like just just had my head down I was yeah. like I, I know this is not Oh, and you know it's a funny yeah, story it's now. It's especially funny. Just they the won way, the game. Like, you, know, <laughs> you know, I just love that. Like the beginning, the, like when you had your head down at first, did you even anticipate the second? No, part? which that's the best part. No, no, I, I it was just happening, and I was in my head, just like, please, please get to the music part. Yeah. Please get to the music part. Yeah. And I got there, and I was like, oh, thank God. And then, oh, and no. then again, oh, no. <laughs> I was just like, oh, Long time. Oh, I was wrong about how this was good. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, I have since made an edited clip of that song. Right. <laughs> but oh, I was great. and I mean you know I think they were up by a bunch like it yeah. wasn't a huge deal but right. I was just like I just you know head shaking right. head down the fact that somebody in that huddle might have been like who the hell is responsible for this <laughs> well they kind of, I mean they do like yeah. there is a line of communication in terms yeah. of uh, you know people on the field who are in contact with the show people yeah um, and I mean the feedback is not much but occasionally they'll just you know like Mr. Brady is unhappy with this selection. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine Mr. Brady doesn't hear the music at all. Yeah, no, <laughs> but uh, no. maybe he does. I don't know. I think it's heartening, though, that these professional athletes consider music to be so important. But it's not something I'd like take for granted. I I'd no. sometimes imagine that like <clears throat> nobody's pay paying attention to that stuff. Sure. You know? Yeah, and I mean, it's funny. Like Some guys are playing something that works for them personally which unfortunately is terrible for a crowd <laughs> yeah. in terms of energy. <laughs> um, you know, and different players along the way, obviously like Ortiz is a surgeon for walk-up music. And yeah. was, he just had it worked out in terms of the like, I'm standing here, you've said my name, and now I will, you know, knock some dust off and begin the walk to, you know, he, he yeah. made it into a theatrical experience. Would he change it every day too? No, no, okay. no. I mean, sometimes he would keep the same one for a long time. Yeah, uh, if it was working too. And I mean, that's the other thing. Sometimes it's working, it's not working. They get rid of it. Yeah. But other times, like it'll just be like, you know, it's a new song. Yeah. That they just heard. Yeah. And it makes them psyched in the right. way that new songs do. So. So then, what's the pacing of the Bruins? Uh, well, there's no so football. You have the offense to recover mm -hmm. and right. you know get ready to do whatever. Yeah. There's no real. I mean, there's offense and defense in moments in hockey but, right, but right. I mean it, it takes 10 seconds to get from one end of the rink to the other and yeah. you know they can it, anything can happen all the time and yeah. so like trying to get ready I mean a big thing for the Bruins that I had to sort of break a habit was all the other stuff I because I'm coming from improv I don't plan it out at all yeah I mean I just go with whatever feels right in the moment right. kind of thing and you know there's a degree of anticipation where you're well if this happens and this and this happens and that and try and line it all up but like I would not plan, you know, like the dances, dance breaks for like timeouts or whatever right. ahead of time. I just be scrape, just scrambling the whole time, trying yeah. to keep up with playing this and have this ready and put a bed under this person talking, and then also, and they'd be like, "Okay, now hit him with a big crowd tune." Yeah, and I'd be like, "What?" Oh, <laughs> like just freezing up almost, and yeah. be like, "Yeah," and they're like, "Well, it's not like the fifth time I've played that song this week." But yeah. like, yeah, for hockey, I actually now plan ahead a bunch before the game and I still do some of it on the fly I mean I do all the whistles and stuff on the fly because mm -hmm. that has to work that way but um, you know in terms of just like having the basics down for the programming that's a big difference yeah um, I really like hockey I really like I mean it's very fast uh, there's also a roof and a clock yeah which is nice for being a sane person yeah and having a life but uh, I'm really having a blast with that one and then mm -hmm. what's what's the difference when it comes to Celtics well, Celtics is just different. I mean, I, I don't, you know. Because, I mean, it's similar where the offense, defense, yes. back and forth in 10 seconds. And, uh, and they have a very involved and produced show, but there's also an audio engineer. Okay. So I don't have to worry about levels or oh, in-game hosts or anything else. It's literally yeah. just do the music. The biggest change for me for the Celtics for figuring it out, uh, like I would say after the last one, you know, I like shadowed a couple, 
did one, and that was just like an e- effort in survival. Yeah. And then having done another, I, I now I'm like, oh, I could see where you could get good at this. Yeah, Like, yeah. I see where the parts are to do good things. Right. The weird thing in that case is they have crowd prompts. Right. Unlike anybody else, they have the, you know, the defense and yeah. the, the yeah. whatever, which I don't have a... I mean, I'm kind of have I'm developing a feel, but just yeah. talking to people in the game, I'm like, is this... Too much? Too little? Right. It's always too little. Right, I'm not right, doing it enough. Right. You know, but I and there's only like four or five of them, so it's weird. That's just a I learning curve. About that. Defense. Yeah. And there's like five different ones. Yeah. And then you can play, you know, like organ hits or you can have right. that. Yeah. And like that's a whole thing. And obviously if they the possession changes, you have to get out of it really yeah. quick. Did you play all these sports as a kid? No. No? No. Yeah. Not at all. Did, yeah, did, what did you play? Did not play sports. Not, not at all. I cut gym class for like two years. Really? Yeah. That's Which amazing. is the, an amazing thing to say when you have a World Series. Right? Yeah, yeah. Just be like... How many... You have a few of them now, though. Yes and no. Yeah. I don't... The only people who give rings, who have given me a ring, uh, is the Red Sox. Okay. So I don't... I would have like three Patriots rings. Right. Which would be hilarious. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, at this point, I would have a full hand. Yeah. Five of them. Yeah. Um... But that's just they, everybody has their own rules and it's complicated. And Interesting. Yeah, my secret plan is at some point I will befriend a player. Yeah. Because <laughs> then they, they can just like bless you and you can go and right. buy like the lower tier like. ones that are not forty thousand dollars or whatever. But uh, I never ever I was a theater kid. Yeah. Always. And uh, if you throw something at me, I will try to get out of the way rather yeah. than catch it. Right. <laughs> um, which is a thing I have learned with foul balls at Fenway the hard way before. Oh. Um, what happened? Well, they you just come hit? right at you. Yeah. Okay. Well, I tried to catch one once. Okay. That hurts. Yeah. That was dumb. Yeah. But I was like, I'll catch the ball because that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. No. No. This and it's actually funny, like a little bit with football, but even more so with hockey. Like everybody I'm working with knows hockey backwards and forwards, yeah. and learning how hockey works, both in terms of like dramatic tension and also just the rules. Yeah. Has been a huge part of the learning curve. Like I think literally last game, like there was a penalty coming up, and I didn't understand how. They knew it was coming up or something like that. And I yeah. could I mean, like, the ref raises his hand, but I'm like, how do you know who the penalty's on? And right. it's like, I mean, we go, oh, well, because they have the puck, and, and oh, right. okay. Right. But, like, little stuff like that, you know? And, like, icing is complicated. Yeah, that is weird. I understand icing now. Like, why don't you just call it offsides, though? <laughs> right? Isn't well, because it it's the, the puck. Thing? There is offsides. That's okay. different. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, that's the thing. Like, okay. stuff like that, Yeah, you know? I don't know. But so part of that, too, is, like, for baseball... I mean, you know, of the like 30 to 40 things that happen in a game, now I can make situational jokes about things that right, happen. Right, right, But like for hockey, I'm still figuring it out a lot. I mean, yeah. there's fights and that's easy. Right. But like <laughs> I did the bean pot last week and like dusted off one from when I used to do BC hockey because I'd done college hockey, oh, okay. but the rules are just that. different enough. Yeah. Like they actually have different icing rules, which is... Huh. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's a good Wikipedia page. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I played Wrecking Ball by yeah. Miley Cyrus because the guy cruised right into the goalie and knocked yeah. the net off. Yeah. And the crowd full of Northeastern NBU students, yeah. they love it. Scream, yeah. hey, man, like a rat. Whatever. Yeah. Situational. Yeah. But, I, you know, for a Bruins game, I don't I don't have as much of that. Right. right. Or the ones I have are just too weird yeah. that no one gets the joke. Yeah. And I'm like, ah, that's not, okay, try another one. What is it at the end of the day that after doing any of these gigs that, like, keeps you positive well I guess, I guess <laughs> no I mean it's hard to be negative doing these no games. but I know what you mean and it's also I mean the schedule is very demanding yeah and I am getting older yeah. and it is more of a thing where I mean to give you an idea we are here recording now in the middle of February yeah and this was the first two consecutive days off I had had in 2019 oh wow this weekend wow uh, and that was super busy and it was like you know to some degree, the champagne problem of, oh, no, a parade. Right. right, right. <laughs> Which is great. Right. Uh, and parades are the best because they are just the, all of the good parts come together. Right. Um, and I finally recorded this one. I mean, it's just amazing to watch an entire block of college kids yeah. start screaming Mo Bamba at the top of their lungs. Yeah. You know, my parents have no idea what this is. Right. But they are like, look at them all singing. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, they all know that song. It came out an hour ago. Um, <laughs> which also I never realized that until I did it that the music plays on the whole parade at once. Oh, wow, like the, yeah. Like each, each flatbed is playing the same music yeah. at the same time. That's awesome. Yeah. Which, talk about a thing to get weirdly good at. Like yeah. this, my fourth parade. Yeah. You learn that, like, I played Your Love here yeah. at the you know beginning of the route, but I also played at the end. 
That is crazy. Because it's a totally different set right, of people. Right, right, right. And they also want to hear that song. Right, right. Uh, I really only do that with that, and then all I do is win. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite moments, my favorite um, things that happens in the parade. Uh, so all I do is win, Khaled and everybody else. Um, <laughs> slowly evolving into the unofficial parade anthem of the city. Yeah. But you saw it here where uh, the crazy thing is, particularly when you do it with a million of people all uh, slammed together in one city square, is, you know, all I do is win and win no matter what, money on my mind, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and every time I open a building, everybody's hands go up. Yeah. And the whole crowd, their hands go up, and then there's this moment of silence. Nobody screams, nobody cheers, everybody, like... They're all dead silent, all yeah. these people in one place, and then they all scream, ah, I tell you that, yeah, yeah. and whatever, but just that moment of like, ah, everybody's hands go up. It's bizarre to look out over all those people. Like, it happens occasionally in sports, but there's yeah. always you can just like a low whatever. Yeah. But everybody has just screamed and yeah. is taking a breath or whatever, and there's just this like very quiet moment that's like very zen like of like, ah, are they saying that? And then oh, everybody gets awesome. right back into it and screams. So it's a very, uh, Oh, so it's stuff like that. The momentary zen-like silence of thousands in a stadium. Thank you to TJ Connolly for coming by. The Red Sox home opener at Fenway Park is less than a month away. It's against the Toronto Blue Jays on April 9th, which is one day after the April term at Berkeley Online begins. Sign up for a course now at online.berkeley.edu. Thanks to Andrew Walls for audio editing assistance. He cut this conversation between two old friends down from nearly two hours. Thanks also to Gabriel Reifer Cohen for mastering this episode. Thanks to Mark Thomas for graphics. And thanks to you for listening to Music Is My Life. Also, if you haven't had a chance to check out the Roaring Crowd Fund, the other Berkeley online podcast, Check it out at www.theroaringcrowdfund.com. Thank you so much. <laughs>